So my name is Annick Massalo and I'm going to take this first What If Lecture um, of 2015. Um, before we start, I need to give you some housekeeping um, instruction in case of a fire alarm. We are going to follow the UC staff and they're going to direct us and we have to basically walk out this way and um, go into the car park out there. Um, and that's the evacuation point for us. And if there is in the unlikely event of an earthquake, <laughs> we are not making jokes about that here. Um, we are to stay where you are. We are you stay where you are. I go under. And, uh, and uh, then once it's stopped, we can evacuate. And again, we follow the UC staff, so those with the UC uh, logo. Um, and uh, the format of this uh, lecture is going to be 45 minutes about. I'm trying to keep desperately to 45 minutes because I have so many little funny stories to tell you, but I'm going to try to keep to my 45 minutes. And then there'll be 10 minutes question at the end. And uh, yes, that's about it. So um, yes, Kiora again. And uh, so I should introduce myself. I said already that I'm uh, Annick Masselow and I'm, I'm an associate professor in law in the Department of Accounting and Information Systems in the Business and Economics School um, in UC. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm originally French, as you can hear. Uh, but um, now, a few years back, I've become a New Zealander, but they've only given me a passport, not a new accent, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> You're just going to have to put up with it. And on top of that, I'm a lawyer as well. I have um, worked most of my uh, adult life into the area of gender equality. I have, um, I have done some work in Europe, mostly uh, on gender equality. I've worked with the European Union, um, and um, I I used to draft legislation for the European Union and, um, and uh, look at their uh, implementation of legislation. I've written a book on reconciliation between work and family life a few years back, and I'm still working on another book which should be finished uh, at the end of this month, I think. Well, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, so when I arrived uh, to New Zealand about nine years ago now, um, with my luggage of uh, European lawyer and gender equality, um, I was a very strange thing. Uh, people were looking at me like, what European law? Well, clearly, no one is interested in European law here. Um, but gender equality, I was a little bit surprised. No one was really quite interested in gender equality. Um, and uh, to some extent, it makes sense that New Zealand would be more interested in race relations than in gender equality. But at the same time, I was really, um, I don't know, a little bit surprise and, and a little bit saddened about it. Um, I used to, uh, uh, I used to um, every year to celebrate um, uh, International Women's Day with my colleague um, Natalia Shaban um, and we used to, you know, say, oh, happy International Women's Day, and everyone would look at us thinking, what are you talking about? Of course, she's Ukrainian and I'm French, so uh, we knew what we were talking about because we celebrate these things in Europe. And, but uh, um, here it wasn't really the case. So I'm, I was really quite um, delighted when I was asked to talk on the first What If Lecture because it was the first day or the first couple of days after International Women's Day, which just happened on Sunday, the 8th of March. Um, so, um, yes, so I'm go because of that, I'm going to just have a quick look at, uh, oh, that's, that starts well. Um, I'm going to have a quick look at uh, what's the 8th of March and um, International Women's Day. This is, uh, this is Clara uh, Zetkin. Uh, she's a German theorist, an activist, an advocate of women's rights. Well, she was, she's not anymore, um, as you can tell from the outfit. Um, she proposed the installation of, um, or the establishment of International Women's Day in 1910, and she ran it the, at, a, at an international conference in Copenhagen in Denmark, and she ran it the first year in 2011. Um, the idea, I mean, the, the, this idea of um, International Women's Day has 
been was some somehow on the card for a little bit of time. The 19 from the 1900s. Um, this is a time of turbulence, um, a change of uh, economy, and um, radical theory coming up, um, coming to the forefront. A lot of war, a lot of um, struggle, economic struggle, um, and so um, uh, there were a lot of uh, demand for um, women's uh, basic economic rights and political rights as well. But um, economic rights. There were a lot of demonstration, and there were a lot of um, um, repression uh, of those demonstrations. Um, in there is, there are some debates over historian whether in in New York there were this demonstration of women workers that were um, violently repressed. Um, we don't know whether this actually happened, but this is a bit of the symbol of all of those um, uh, those demonstrations that took place and that were violently uh, repressed. Now, International Women's Day did take. Uh, did, did, was installed um, in the sort of a Soviet bloc quite earlier on after or during World War I and, and, and shortly after. Um, but it's not until 1977 that the UN um, uh, uh, invited the member states to proclaim the 8th of March, uh, the UN Day for Women's Rights and World Peace. Um, so um, it's a day for global celebra celebration of economic, political, and social achievement. But also, I think it's a day to take stock of the um, uh, lack of uh, achievement and the drawback. And in keeping with this, um, this idea of economic uh, um, achievement, I'm going to keep with the economic aims and the economic um, uh, rights uh, in this talk. I'm also going to try to keep to the New Zealand background or the industrialized sort of background because I'm, I think that if we get outside of the economic talk and if we, and if we get outside of you know, the employment sort of talk and if we get outside of New Zealand, it gets really, really depressing. And it's depressing enough when we just look at New Zealand. Although, I must say, I am really, sorry, I am really quite um, uh, amazed and, um, uh, yes, amazed to see so many people at such a talk. Um, so, anyway, thank you for coming. Um, okay, so, uh, we are in a system where men are the dominant sex. Um, in economic terms, at least. Uh, men have been the dominant um, sex because in, in this society and, and, and in most societies forever, um, because the system is divided into two, um, into two spheres, two areas. We have the public sphere and the private sphere. And this um, division has been quite well articulated by Aristotle back in the antiquities in Greece. In Greek, so it's not it's not like something new that he's that has just happened to us. We're part of this system that has been quite settled for quite a long time. Um, in the public sphere, in the public sphere, work is accounted for by traditional accounting, um, and it's valued. It is paid. Men are entitled to work in it, to participate in it. They're expected to. Women are at best tolerated. Depending, you know, for example, for a long time, women couldn't work at night unless they were prostitutes or nurses. Um, for a long time, women were expected to stop working in the workplace once they got married. And for a long time, in New Zealand, for example, until 1960, there were two um, pay scales in the public service. There were one for men, higher, and one for women, lower. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's part of the system. Poor women, of course, have always worked. Um, in the private sphere, uh, women, uh, women do most of the work in the private sphere. The work is not accounted for and it is not valued. It is mostly uh, done by women, as I said, traditionally, and women remain to this day the uh, primary carer for children and dependent adults and doing most of the work in the private sphere. But things are changing. Recently, things have been changing. Um, for two, women are doing really well in education, for example. For two men that get a university degree at the moment, three women get a university degree. Um, 
for uh, women have entered every profession we can think of. Um, they have been in space, they're going to war, they're running countries. Um, in New Zealand in particular, they've run countries, this country. Um, in the US, um, women are now more employed than men. Uh, they represent the majority of the workplace. In Europe, the monarchy, have, the monarchy have changed their rules on succession, and now baby girls can become the monarch if they are the firstborn. Um, in the US fertility clinic, we're hearing reports that hopeful parents more often want to have baby girls than baby boys. So things are like changing. The economic successes of women um, seems to be an indicator for the overall economic uh, well-being of any given country. <sighs> ah, no, wrong one, wrong one. This one. Um, so, <laughs> in her book, entitled The End of Men, um, Hannah Roshin observed that in the post-industrial economy, women are favored over men. Um, as I said, women are doing better in education. Um, is this the end of the male domination over the female subordination? Um, marriage, the traditional subordination institution, seems to be in decline. And is this, are we looking at a global future where women will have will will do the work in the in the public sphere? Um, will they be paid at higher rates than men? Uh, will they earn more? Will they, will they be able to, will they have the power, the decision-making power? Um, this is a feminist utopia of sorts. So, looking at this, all these changes, the historical and legal preference for male that has, um, that seems to be eroding, um, some have argued that in this post-industrial um, society, um, Women are better suited than men, and therefore, possibly, we don't need equality anymore. We don't need that quest for equality anymore. Some feminists will say, well, if we were never about equality anyway, we were about liberation. I'm more cautious, I think, that uh, equality is a realistic step, which is far, far, far away. Um, but maybe we don't even need feminism. Some... Um, in Western world, more, more likely, more often white women that are relatively well off have argued that we don't need feminism anymore. And we don't need equality either because we've achieved it all. We are now individuals that can make our own choices and we can realize our own choices. Indeed, women have entered the workplace everywhere. They are, um, as I said, um, a lot of women are in economically independent. They uh, seem to be there to stay on the workplace. Um, and they have realized that earning income um, is good for them, for their family. Um, and, um, and it's important for the growing economy. So it fits really well with the neoliberal sort of like theory um, that of the, this idea of growth. And so over the past couple of decades, two or three decades now, governments in industrialized country, in post-industrialized country, have encouraged women to get into the labor market and stay in it, remain in it. So it fits really well. Women want to enter the labor market and the states want them in it and wants them to stay in it. Um, we've, uh, in New Zealand, we have one of the highest uh, employment rates of all the OECD countries. So those are the sort of industrialized, post-industrialized country. Um, so we have a really high rate of um, uh, female participation, about 64%, and uh, the male participation is about 65, uh, 75%. Um, so um, there doesn't seem to be any limit for women. And as I said, the financial crisis that, ha that has hit, uh, that has um, had a big impact in Europe and in the US does not seem to have impacted on women's employment, they're, they're staying into, into employment, they're not going back home. So, it's all well, isn't it? I can just leave. Um, is it all well in the labor market? Well, in New Zealand we have two indicators that tells us maybe things aren't that well. 
Um, one of them is that uh, the employment of women with preschool children is very low. In fact, it's one of the lowest with uh, the Czech Republic and Japan for, uh, for those OECD countries, those industrialized countries. We also have a rate of 35%, that's more than one out of three women that works part-time. What does that tell us? It tells us that women are still not able to do full-time employment. So I'm going to talk to you about the glass ceiling, the leaky pipe, the second shift, and the, the shop floor. And you think maybe you've stepped into an, uh, an engineering talk sponsored by QC. No, 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 stay with me. It's not, no. Um, this, those are um, some, of the, some of the important um, indicators or um, issues that are highlighting the um, unequal treatment of men and women in the employment workforce. Um, and, I will, and, and, and they're also, we're looking at a spectrum, um, people at the bottom, people at the top, and, um, and people everywhere, people in between. So let me start with the second shift. Uh, I feel it. I feel it every day. Um, <laughs> Ali Hochschild, in her book entitled The, Sh the Second Shift, argues rightly, I think, that a dual burden of paid work and family obligation continue to be women's main, main um, uh, burden. Uh, traditional visu vision of care clashes directly with the achievement of women in paid employment. Um, so what's the problem, basically, in simple terms? Well, women just do an awful lot of domestic tasks, unpaid tasks, um, in the household. Um, women do about 65% of work that is unpaid against 35% of men, uh, against 35% of men doing uh, unpaid tasks. So this is linked to the fact that men and women do not share equally the housework. Um, men, are, men are more likely to spend more hours in paid work, and women, women are more likely to spend time in, um, in the, doing unpaid domestic work. Um, in fact, this, this is uh, very apparent once children happen in the family. So once children happen, men do a lot more work in the paid employment and, and women do a lot more work in the domestic sphere. Um, the 2009-2010 time use survey found that 65% um, of men's work was paid um, and 65% of women's work was unpaid. On average, in New Zealand, women do every day four hours and 20 minutes of work that is unpaid, domestic unpaid work. On average, in New Zealand, men do every day two hours and 30 minutes. In fact, it's written two hours and 32 minutes. But we'll, okay, two minutes, it counts. Um, so women do four hours and 20 minutes of unpaid work every day and men two hours and 32 minutes every day. And so you add that over the week, over the year, over the decades, and then you can see that there is a big discrepancy between the two. I'm not knocking down male uh, men, Kiwi men here, because m Kiwi men are doing really well, actually, by comparison, it's all perspective, by comparison to other men elsewhere. So on average, in this OECD industrialized country, men are doing just about two hours per day. So Kiwi men are doing half an hour and two minutes more than the uh, average men elsewhere. Um, should we celebrate? <laughs> uh, the entire market economy would stop, would completely grind to a stop if people were, in, if women stopped doing the domestic work, the unpaid work. Marilyn Waring um, was uh, giving, delivering a speech on International Women's Day uh, this year, and she said, can we think of any equivalent treatment of something men did for century unpaid? Yes, it was called slavery. But Exploiting women is apparently just fine. She's saying it, not me. <laughs> um, the second thing we're going to look at is the leaky pipe. Okay, so the leaky pipe is a metaphor for um, 
that describes how women drop out of mostly science, engineering, technological, and mathematic uh, sorts of careers, um, but also um, university careers. Um, so those those are two, the leaky pipe shows how women leak out of the science and and academic uh, pipeline at disproportionate uh, high rate. Um, the, the, why do we have that? One of the reasons we have the leaky pipe is that um, there is a lack of shared housework. I've already talked about that. And the fact uh, that we have a high and um, expensive uh, care system. So if you put your children in childcare, you should know how much it costs you. It's uh, really quite something in this country, but in many other countries. Um, but also at the other end, the old age care is also um, quite something. Um, Statistic information tells us that um, there is this leaking out. So I'm giving you an example um, at university, for example. And this is, this is, a, this is a, some statistics that I have from the US. But I think, I, I mean, from what I, I know, it's, it's very similar elsewhere. It's very similar here. Um, we have about 62% of, of female students that do masters. And we have about 32 percent, um, sorry, 50, 54 percent, so a little bit over half of them, of women, are doing PhDs. And then after that, it drops down. And you go to senior lecturer, and you have about 30 percent of female so, uh, senior lecturer. And you go to associate professor, and you have about 20 percent. And you go to professor, and you have 15 percent. And this is the disproportionate leaking out. So this is the way it works. Um, so let's go to the bottom, the shop floor. We rarely talk about uh, women on the, on the shop floor, and yet uh, that's where we have some of the most, the fiercest battle at the moment in New Zealand. The neoliberal reform have concentrated on um, GDP, the unionization, um, deregulation of the labor standard. The language is all economic. It's all about how to reduce costs for business. It's all about how to increase the, um, the, the productivity. Um, and, um, and so the language, the economic language, informs us on um, how the employment law rights are developing. We do have work family reconciliation in New Zealand, but a lot of those rights are addressed to professional, relatively well off women. Um, so when, they, when those rights exist, those gender equality rights, those work-life balance rights, they often are inadequate for those people that are in marginalized or precarious work. Um, and even when they're relevant, they're really under on force or even simply ignored. And, um, and even when they are not ignored, a lot of those workers are incapable unable to access the justice system. Um, so um, I, I want to illustrate some of those battles. I want to illustrate with one of the, one of the battles that is um, happening in New Zealand at the moment on equal pay. Yes, because let's face it, there is gen a gender pay cap in New Zealand. Um, so on Sunday, the UN released a report uh, on um, when the gender pay gap was going to close. And uh, the, the, the report uh, indicated about 70 years, which I think is quite positive, because in previous years, I had seen 100 years. So we're, we're getting there, maybe, one day. Um, so this is an average for the industrialized country. Um, so in New Zealand, we have a gender pay gap that is about 10%. It varies. It hovers over uh, 10%. Um, and uh, there are some professions where, and, and particularly lawyers, a lot of those professions where it's very difficult to, um, to have very clear, uh, um, uh, where, where, the, where the pay is quite obscured. So lawyers, accounting firm, all these kind of like a, a skills, they, they might pay uh, female lawyers and, uh, and male lawyers different uh, salary for the same job. Um, but mostly, I think, in New Zealand, Pay is the same for same work. So mostly, I mean, it's very rare that an employer will say, oh, I'll pay you less because you're a woman. Or at least they, they'll have the cleverness not to say it, at least. Uh, they might hide it. Um, but mostly what happened in New Zealand uh, is that we have a segregated uh, labor market. And women are mostly working in areas that are mostly 
uh, uh, underpaid and their traditional female job like care, work, and cleaning and cooking. Um, and so we should also, well, no, what am I, I, I was going to say we should celebrate. No, 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 we should not celebrate. By international standard, uh, New Zealand is doing quite well because um, the gender pay gap at 10% is one of the shortest compared to um, Europe where it's on average about 25% in the US also. Um, so it's, it's quite, it's quite, it's not so bad. Anyway, in, uh, recently in Sweden there was a study that showed that actually, well it's not really 10%. Um, if you take into account the qualification of women that are now um, Become, becoming more important. In fact, women should be paid more, 10%. So, in fact, it's about 20%, um, that, uh, that gender pay gap. Anyway, last week I was, um, was it last week or is it this week? Yeah, it was this week. I had lunch with a colleague of mine, a lawyer, um, and she was telling me, talking about this lecture, she was telling me, my you know, if we had equal pay, would that not create difficulty for business? I, I, I was shocked. I just didn't even know what to say. This is the slavery argument, you know. The slaver said, well, if we have to pay those people, our business won't profit anymore. We'll be in trouble, of course. But of course. Um, but this, is, this illustrates the sort of like economic debate in which we are and in which we justify ourselves that equal pay should not happen because those poor business might suffer from it. <laughs> But believe it or not, this is an argument that is happening at the moment. Um, the argument is developed by some company following a court of appeal decision that was that just take place that just took place in Bartlett against Terra Nova. Here is our hero, uh, Christine Bar Bartlett. Um, she is uh, she's a, um, a care worker. She's worked most of her life um, in old age care um, work. She's been paid just above the minimum wage all her life. And uh, she's just won, uh, with the help of the Service and Food Worker Union, a landmark case, which happened in uh, November of uh, 2014, uh, whereby uh, the Court of Appeal decided that the 1972 Equal Pay Act not only applies, but apply not just to pay for uh, equal pay for equal work, but equal pay for work of equal value. And so this gives us a chance for once to think that, oh, possibly we can revalue care. We can revalue all those traditional jobs that are held by women. But those companies, those care companies are saying, whoa, 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 if we have to pay those care or more, we won't be able to profit, and that will, be, that will, that will create some trouble for us. This is my argument, the slaver argument back. Anyway, let's go from the shop floor to the glass ceiling. Okay, we don't feel too sorry for those women because they've almost made it, so they're not in such a dire position, let's face it. But women don't make it to the top in New Zealand and elsewhere. What's the glass ceiling? It's a political term, an, another metaphor, um, that is used to describe the thin yet unreachable barrier that keeps minority and women uh, from rising the upper rung of the corporate ladder regardless of their qualification or achievement. It's used mostly in business but it's, um, it's, uh, it can very well apply to science and uh, I've applied it to other places, um, university, law firms, what have you. Um, in New Zealand, um, the top 100 company, private company, the top listed company, have 12% of um, women directors. In law firms, it's not much better. Um, the top uh, law firms in Auckland uh, have 19% partner, even though we have more female law students since 1992. Um, as I said, university professors are 15%. Um, the Fortune 500 companies have 24 uh, female CEO. So, what does that tell us? That tells us women are rubbish. They can't make it. Um, I have a few facts that I really love. Um, fewer large companies are run by women than men called John. In fact, for every, that's for the US, we don't know, I don't know about New Zealand actually. In fact, in the US, for every four companies that are run by 
men call John. There is one woman. So, change your name to John right now. <laughs> Female CEOs. It takes on average, on average 24 years for women to become CEOs. It takes on average 15 years for men to become CEOs. Okay, so, why is it that women don't make it to the top? It's a combination of this glass ceiling and this leaky pipe and other things. Um, there is a mix of gender bias, um, statistical discrimination. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of these um, experiments that um, uh, some uh, science scientists are doing where they present employer with two CVs. They're the same CVs, or they don't present them the same employer. But anyway, they present employer with two CVs, same CVs, but on one it's a female name and on the other one it's a male's name. And systematically, the, uh, the employer, where, regardless of whether the employer is a woman or a man, the employer is going for the male CV, systematically. It's quite impressive. At university, we have student evaluation forms, so we teach, and at the end of the year, we tell our students, oh, what did you think about our teaching? Um, and this is part of our promotion, so we can use it. It's one of the, um, uh, one of the um, components that gives us promotion. Um, and we have recently some um, experiments that have taken place in the, in the US, some research has taken place in the US that shows that actually, again, it's the same CV experiment. Um, they took, um, they, they were uh, doing a survey of online um, teaching. And so the students had never seen the teacher. And so sometimes they would put the name of a teacher that was a female, and sometimes they would put the name of a teacher that was a man. And there were 20% difference between the evaluation of men uh, teacher and female teacher, lower for women. Um, I'm gonna stop about that, because this is... <sighs> uh, anyway, uneven distribution of uh, domestic tasks, I've talked about that. Geographical relocation of, of, of male partner. Oh, if you're in a, if you're in a, in a couple and uh, your partner is a man, uh, like my husband is, and... Um, Systematically, you have to follow him. I have followed him everywhere. I'm such a bad feminist. <laughs> I have, I have. It does happen, even to me. I try to hold on to it, but it, no, it has. Broad societal gender stereotypes. The myth that we have two different brains. We have the female brain and the male brain. In fact, there are books on it. Women are from Venus and men are from Mars. That's science for you. Um, women cannot do math. Uh, women cannot do finance. In fact, uh, there are on average more women in finance classes than men. Um, women scientists, women business, business women, business uh, women that make it, they're kind of seen as abnormal. But on the, on, by, by contrast, men who choose to look after their children, they're also seen as kind of weird people. Um, the everyday, I wasn't going to add that, but I, I should add that. The everyday violence and gender um, um, sexism is also um, uh, holding back um, women. Um, there is a surgeon in, the, in Australia this, this week, oh, we had so many news this week, that said, well, actually, you know, women in hospital, they, should, they just should put up with sexual harassment because, you know, it's just part of being a surgeon, a female surgeon in hospital. Every time I do a public release, a press release, here, every time I do one, I get hate mail. But we are in a meritocracy. The argument is that, well, if women could make it to the top, they would, on their merit. They're just not qualified enough. They are not caring enough about work, they care more about their family. Well, this is really weak in terms of argument because we see that actually women are more qualified than men and they've been so now for quite some time. And this is true in quite a lot of area. It's not true in science. In science we still don't have, uh, in some science, in physics, in maths, in engineering in particular, we don't have enough women qualified. But in finance or in biology, we do have enough women. Um, and women, and 
aspire to responsibility. In fact, the Westpac survey of 2004, uh, 2014, sorry, uh, found that 55% of women aged 19 to 29 wants to be, they want to be general manager, head of division, or CEO, boss. That demonstrates that they want to become bosses, that they want to, they want to, uh, to, to, to have responsibility. And, which we, and, and also what we found is that discrimination does not happen with children. It happens way before that. Remember that CV, those two CVs? They don't have children on those two CVs. But we have some driver for action. Some people are just saying this is enough. Why don't we have enough representation? Maybe on corporate board, maybe in science. Not in New Zealand. In New Zealand, this is not happening. People do not want to see anything happening in that area, or at least... That's my sense that people are not outraged by the lack of women in um, on top uh, on, on the board of a corporate company of corporate um, organization. Um, but it is quite a dissatisfaction. We see it in Europe. We see it in Australia for the mo at the moment. We see it in Asian countries. At the moment, there is quite a lot of dissatisfaction with this, and this is following the financial crisis. Um, Following the 2008 financial crisis that transformed into an economic crisis, I'm not even going to go define that, there were a lot of questions that arise about how the board of some of the largest companies in the world, those boards that were heavily um, um, membered by men, membered by men, can we say that, um, dominated by men, um, Sylvia Walby talked about the monoculture of decision making in financial uh, company. Those have made the, the worst decision and have led all of us citizens uh, to suffer the consequences. So don't we need diversity in those boards? Christine Lagarde, the head of the um, IMF in 2010 says or ask or says, um, if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters, today's economic crisis would clearly look different. Of course, we cannot speculate on that. I can only quote her. But we have some normative justification. That's my legal thing. We have some justification for wanting more gender balance at the top in decision-making process, um, either in corporate board, in science, um, in politics. Um, there is this issue of role model. I had, um, I had a talk with the head of the physics department. It's, it's so easy for me to have talks with the head of the physics department at UC because my husband is a physicist. Um, but uh, he was saying, oh, women physicists, they just don't know what to look like, what to behave like, how to be. You know, it's really difficult because there is not much role model for them. And of course, if you follow the uh, sitcom, uh, you know, um, then uh, the stereotypes comes, you know, full in your head. You know, in the Big Bang Theory, scientists, female scientists are weird. Mind you, the men are weird as, you, as well. <laughs> Mind you, maybe in physics they're weird anyway. <laughs> but, I mean, I know, I, know some, I, know, I know a lot of female f physicists that aren't really weird. Um, um, there, are three, there are three main normative um, justifications that can be identified to uh, lead for... Um, to, to argue for legal regulation in this area. Um, the economic, the business case argument, of course, we're, we're in this neoliberal um, uh, system, so of course, if we talk economics, everyone will agree with us. Well, so it's about enhancing equality of decision making, improving the system, governance, and, and ethics. It's about the better utilization of the talent pool. Um, it's a driver for innovation. Better minoring the, the mirroring, sorry, the market, um, because women are most uh, are, are very they're, they're the consumer, and so therefore, you know, we have to like look at what the consumer wants. Um, I don't find this very convincing for having women maybe on corporate board. I think also um, it's not necessarily the state's place to intervene in that area. And most importantly, I think it's reintroducing those stereotypes that women will bring something to those corporate board or science that you know men don't have. And to my mind, there is less difference than, 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 than we think. The other argument is um, individual equal opportunity justification. So this is a matter of individual fairness. Um, equal qualification should give people the same chances. Um, 
to be part of body, even when they're private bodies, uh, to yield that, that have uh, economic power and those bodies that actually have an impact on everyday um, citizen, whether it's economic, financial, or their social life. And then there is a social public interest and fundamental uh, right argument um, that is uh, more about the general interest. It's important to have balanced representation because it's part of social justice, um, it's part of democratic legitimacy, and it's part of general equal opportunity. And so I think with those three normative justifications, we should be able to get some legislation out, but not in New Zealand. No one is interested in New Zealand. Okay, so let me, let me move on to what the, the, the system in which we're living. We're living in this neoliberal system which values individualism and autonomy and does not value dependence and care. And so, so therefore we don't pay people who care very much because we don't like that. And um, um, what I argue is that we should look at our life cycle and we should all consider that we've all at some point been in a dependent position. We've all at some point needed care. We've all been babies and to these days there are no babies that survive without care. So all of us, we've been babies. At that point we needed help. We needed to be, we were dependent. None of us are immune to accident or illness and in this aging society, more and more of us are going to, need, are going to require care in old age. So this is almost a given that this is going to happen to us at both ends of our life. But more importantly, those people that are the most independent, the most autonomous, those people in their suit, in the top of their ivory tower, um, who do not need any care in appearance, they actually require more care than all of us because they cannot provide it for themselves. So they, 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 they rely on their wife or they outsource their care from elsewhere, sometimes from other country, so that they're cleaning and they're cooking and they're looking after their children or their dogs, um, mowing their lawn, etc. is done by other people than themselves. So actually, autonomy is a bit of a, a smoke and mirror. Overall, we need uh, for society, I think, we need for society to work towards smashing traditional gender stereotypes. Oh, that's very easy done. Um, and those are holding women back. Um, in a 2002 report that I wrote for the European Commission, I, I, I reached some conclusions which you know, are very similar for New Zealand and I've worked with Aust uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission and they're very similar. Um, they, we were looking at... Um, um, pregnancy and maternity rights, but actually they're, they're also, also working for employment rights, employment, yeah, employment protection rights and gender equality. Um, overall, in New Zealand, in, in those developed countries, those industrialized countries, we do have a relatively good system, legal system. The framework is not so bad. I mean, it could be improved, but it's not so bad. And in New Zealand, I've indicated there are areas where we can do better. But overall, it's not so bad. The reality is that those systems are not, um, they are under, uh, under uh, uh, utilized because cultural stereotypes are so much alive. Because we think that women are, their primary aim is to look after children and old age people and, and dependent people and to do the cleaning and, and all that. And we don't see women are, as workers in their full rights. Um, and generally speaking, gender equality are more uh, sophisticated in public sector than in private sector. However, what we've seen is that in a number of global large companies, we've seen some quite amazing leadership in gender equality. So just recently, um, Vodafone has installed for all of its workers 16 weeks paid maternity leave for all of its workers. So of course, in Europe, it means nothing because they have that by law, but in the US, that's like Christmas. Um, the National Australia Bank just um, last week um, adopted 12 weeks paid parental leave for all of its workers. Um, Google, of course, has been working really hard on gender equality. They're trying to attract women engineers. Um, KPMG has worked really hard on the gender pay gap. And in KPMG at the moment, there is a gender pay gap of 2%. 
Um, so we have more discrimination in smaller companies. Um, the involvement of a father, of course, is really important. So on one level, feminism has you know, pushed women to do more, higher, get that, reach everything. But what we haven't had is the other way around, where father or men are allowed to open themselves to um, caring and, and sharing and, and, and looking at and doing more of the domestic task because it's not been valued. So we've got this double um, sort of like vision where production is very valued and reproduction is not valued. And we need to change this. So in New Zealand, it's still um, the case that raising pig is more valued than raising children. Um, in economic terms, uh, inequality is, I would argue, inequality is expensive. Social, justice, social injustice is not a saving, and at the end, we all have to pay. But, um, I don't know, I don't really like the economic talk. Of course, it's expensive inequality. But the moral talk um, is about the fact that we need to fight for this equality. So for all those people who say we don't need it, I think, no, we need to fight for it. It's not good enough to point stereotypes. In fact, when we point towards stereotypes, we just reinforce them. No, we have to say we have those stereotypes and it's unacceptable and we will do better. And we need to do that in companies. Uh, we need to do that at universities, and we need to do that in companies. And we need to actively do that. And voila. I'll just leave you here with that. So if you have any questions.